Father, we are grateful this morning. As always, you have been faithful. Thank you for your word. A lamp unto our feet, a light on our path. Speak, Lord, we ask. Help us to see what you are saying. Help us to apply same to our lives today. And thank you for the results that nothing and no one can stop. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to read from Genesis chapter 41. The title of today's message is From Prison to Ephraim. From Prison to Ephraim. Genesis 41 from verse 50. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. Jacob was one of the patriarchs in the Old Testament. His name became Israel after he had an encounter with God. So one of the most important people in Jewish history, he was. Now, he had 12 sons. Jacob was the 11th of those sons. His favorite wife gave birth to Joseph after many years of waiting. Even though there was one brother born after that, this guy was his favorite son. And when he was 17 years old, God gave him dreams of greatness. And it seemed like those dreams were never going to come to pass with the circumstances of his life. His brothers envied him. No doubt he was precocious. He was intelligent and uh, he ratted on his older brothers to his father. Things he did wrong, uh, he told his father about it and maybe they were punished. Anyway, they conspired against him. And you would think things like that, that practically happen in every family, polygamous family in particular, where there will be some kind of rivalry or the other, who just die with childhood. But in this case, they took it a little too far, conspired against him, wanted to kill him, why not for God? And then they threw him in a pit, and then he ended up sold into a foreign land where he became a slave, or Maulini or Lono, somebody from a well-to-do family, became a slave in a foreign land. As though that was not bad enough, someone lied against him, somebody he looked up to, his master's wife lied against him, and he ended up in jail. How can somebody be in Agodi Gate, Agodi Prison, a foreigner, a Togolese, a Ghanaian, who be in prison in Nigeria and now rise to a place of prominence? You and I know naturally that's impossible. You can't be a prisoner in a foreign land and amount to something in life. But the dreams that God gave this guy, because God is a promise keeper, I don't know what he showed you in his word. I don't know what he ministered to you personally. I don't know where you see yourself being. No matter the circumstances of today, if you will walk with God, you will get there. Can you please shout hallelujah? So when things turned around, because God was with him, that's a reframe. We're going to see that in a while. When things will be bad for Joseph, the Bible will say, but well, God was with Joseph. Say with me, God is with me. Okay, if you don't believe it, tell somebody, maybe the person will believe, say God is with you. Tell somebody on the other side, God is with you. Now say it again, God is with me. So despite what life may seem like now, God is with you if you are born again Christian. God was with Joseph. And uh, eventually things turned around. He became prime minister in a foreign land. And then he was given a wife from a prominent family in that country. She gave birth to the first son named Manasseh, meaning forgetting. He said, God has made you forget all the toil in my father's house. You know, you may be thinking, ah, this, this time is tough. I mean, I can never forget this that has happened and all that. And I say, way God can bless you that we swallow up all of those things and you will forget. May God make you to forget the pain that you may be going through now. And then he had a second born and called him Manasseh. Excuse me, Ephraim. Ephraim means fruitful. He said, because God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I like that. In the same place where you may have been reproached, where somebody may have looked down, talked down at you, where it seemed like nothing was going to happen. So that's what God is talking about to us today. Now, I want us to see Genesis 48 right now, and we see the blessing that Jacob spoke over the life of this favorite son of his, Joseph, by inspiration. So when those Old Testament patriarchs wanted to die, they called their children together and spoke over their lives as inspired by God 
And those things happened that way. So let's see what he said to Joseph. Genesis 48 from verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with the sword and my bow. So he was going to be a first among equals. God has that in mind for you today. Chapter 49 now, from verse 22, when he was speaking the blessings. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. For there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the hand of your father, who will help you. That's what they sang this morning about the stone of hell. Who will help you, and by the Almighty, who will bless you. Will you please say amen? With the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under Blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be upon the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. No one wants to be in prison. A, pr a prison is a place you don't want to be. Now, I know you are not incarcerated physically right now. But personally, I've always seen prison as a place that is small, a place that is dark, a place that is empty, a place that is bound, a place where you are uncomfortable, a place where you are locked in and there seems to be no way out. Let me say it again, small. I don't think anybody lives large in prison, ordinarily. I mean, no matter how large you think you are living in prison, you don't want to be there. You would rather be elsewhere. So if life seems small for you now, I mean, what do you have? What do you own? What do you possess? As we have just been told and reminded, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Or things are dark. I don't think a prison is well lit anywhere in the world. So maybe things are dark for you right now. You can't see the way out. Maybe life seems empty. Who will give you a city in prison? You have labored. You have worked. You have struggled. You can't see anything that you have struggled about or worked for. Empty. Maybe you feel bound. I told them at the spring service, I once had a patient who was from the prison yard, and he kept saying the outside world, the outside world, when I was in the outside world, when I was in the outside world, because he was not in the outside world as far as anything he could do to be in the outside world. So he had an issue that made him come out to the outside world. He kept referring to the outside world. Because in prison, you are bound. You are uncomfortable. You are locked in. There seems to be no way out. In the last one year, last two years, many young people have left this country. Many young people have relocated. Almost everybody you haven't seen for a while, when you find out about them, they've gone to another country. Maybe you can't even afford it. You know, it costs a lot of money. What people pay to take those steps. If God is leading you, last December we spoke along those lines, just ensure that it's God, because there are challenges in every country. So if it's God leading you, fine. Go ahead if it's God. And live as a Christian, otherwise you're going to get into trouble. But many times people don't research those things well and then it's like from frying pan to fire. But you may not even be able to afford it. That, okay, that's what step I also will I want to take. But I can't even afford it. I can't even see the way out. I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm just, and yet you are talking about from prison to Ephraim. I'm not the one talking about it. It's God's word that is telling us today. That's a plan he has for you. If you remember when, the, and we quote that scripture quite a bit today, Jeremiah 29, 11, I don't know that I think towards you. In other words, I have plans for you. If you go to the first verse of Jeremiah 29, you'll see that they were in captivity in a foreign land. It was not a time, that, God is not telling you when things are looking well, that things are going to be well. It's when things are looking bad. That's like God to tell you, I have great plans for you. I'm taking you somewhere. If you believe it, please shout hallelujah. God was with Joseph. Genesis 39 from verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. How can you be a slave and God is with you? So I don't know where you are now. Tell yourself again, the Lord is with me. And the Bible says he was a successful man. So you don't have to be the CEO before you are a successful person as far as God is concerned. And his master, verse 3, saw that the Lord was with him. So others can see also and if they are not seeing each other about you, they will soon see that God is with you. When they see the things happening in your life, God, God is with this person. So his master saw that the Lord was with him. All that he did, he made to prosper in his hand. Verse 21 of that same chapter. 
The Bible says in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So he was demoted, if you like. He got to prison and again we are seeing that God was with him. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. May that be your testimony also because the Lord is with you as well. Amen. We've seen that Ephraim means fruitfulness. So, how do we move from prison to Ephraim? How do we move from a place that is small, a place that is dark, a place that is empty, a place that we are bound and uncomfortable and locked in and there's no way out, a place where we can barely afford to pay for fuel, a place where food has become so expensive, a place where salaries are the same and everything is going up, a place where federal uh, schools now are to pay three times what they used to pay, a place where how much you are supposed to pay at tuition now is three times what it used to be and not. I mean, uh, how do you move from prison to fruitfulness or Ephraim? Number one, look out. Look out. What we mean by look out is be a blessing to others. I mean, you can barely survive yourself. You say, how can you look out? In Galatians 6, 10, and God's word is no respecter of persons. The Bible says, and that means God says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who have the household of faith. This is talking to every believer. Look out. See who you can be a blessing to. In Genesis 40, from verse 5, we're going to read it in a while. Joseph was in prison. And um, he noticed people who were sad in prison. I don't know why anybody is happy in prison. So it takes a special heart to notice that somebody is sad. From verse 5. Then the butler and the baker, I'm reading Genesis 40 from verse 5. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison had a dream. Both of them each man's dream in one night. And each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, Why do you look sad today? And they answered him, We each had a dream and there is no interpre interpreter of it. We are going to get to that in a while. Why do you guys look sad? Let's imagine knowing human nature. Let's try to use our imagination on what would have happened in prison. Joseph was put in charge of the prisoners, don't forget and the Bible says, whatever was under his authority, the chief warden didn't bother about it anymore. Now, these guys were the chief butler and the chief baker of Pharaoh, the president of the most powerful nation on earth at that time. So they were important people inside. They were people of means. They did something wrong and they were in prison. Do you think they will submit to Joseph's authority easily? I don't think so. They will get there and try to make everyone know we are not at the same level in life. If not for Jotoro, if not for rain that fell that makes them to pack pigeons along with fowls, you and I are not at the same social ladder. That I'm in prison, don't think I'm in prison. I'm not supposed to be here. So I'm sure they work differently. If Joseph wanted to assign duties to them, they would try to frustrate his life and say, well, we're not, we're not at the same level. So it must have, they must have been difficult. If they were human beings, who understands what I'm talking about? Oh, they would try to show that we're not at the same level. If Joseph called them, they wouldn't answer. They would walk slowly, do whatever they were supposed to do, and uh, probably the warden would come to set and say, look, here, here you are a prisoner. Nobody's in, uh, interested in what you are in the outside world, you know? Anyway, Joseph must have earned their respect over time. They must have seen he was for real. He was genuinely caring. And one day they were sad in prison. I said, I don't know if anybody is happy in prison. I don't know. So for you to look out and notice somebody is sad in prison, Do you see other people at all? Do you know what we're going through? That's what God is getting our attention. Look out. Stop to look at yourself and what you don't have. How things are difficult now. Every human being, particularly every Christian, can be a blessing to other people. Our lot is still better than some people's lot. Why are you guys sad today? Who is happy in prison? I don't know. And that's what God is getting our attention to now. Look out. Look out. It reminds me of David in First Samuel. David was a fugitive. David had been anointed for a position. And instead of it coming to pass on time, they were chasing him from pillar to post. And life was difficult. He heard some people were in trouble and he wanted to be a blessing. Let's read it. 1 Samuel 23 from verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah 
and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord. See, God didn't command David. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack the Philistines, these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Caleb against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Caleb, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Caleb and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. Guess what? Who owned the livestock thereafter? They owned the livestock. That's part of how God blessed them. He looked out. He heard these people of Kayla were in trouble. The Philistines were attacking them. What was his business? He had enough to deal with. He was running for his life. Things were not easy for him. Life was difficult and hard. And he was running from cave to cave and all that. But he wanted to be a blessing to others. But he was wise enough to know he needed to ask God. So he asked God and God said, go ahead. But he couldn't do it alone. So he told his team, I believe we should go ahead of those who they said, even we are afraid. So if you think David wasn't afraid at those times, now you know differently. So it's courage, it's faith in God that makes you take some steps. Not that natural circumstances are not negative. He said, we are afraid here in Judah. We should not go and be a blessing to other people when we ourselves can't get by. We're just struggling. In case the voice of men is the voice of God. In case I miss God, let me ask again. So let me ask again. And he was sure that God said, go ahead. So he led his men and they went and won the battle and took the livestock. So part of how God blessed or prospered them at that time was because David looked out to be a blessing to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 12, let's read. We're going to see something in a while. We're going to see that when you, are, you look out and you are a blessing, people's needs are met. Those people thank God, so God is glorified. And then they pray for you, and you are sure that God will answer those prayers. Let's see it in 2 Corinthians 9 from verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So we saw there that needs are met, God is glorified, and then prayer are offered on your behalf. If you make the widow's heart to sing for joy, if you help somebody in this difficult time, if you give somebody a tuba of yam at this time and something, not because you have excess, but because you want to be a blessing. So that's what we are saying, especially to those of the household of faith. Look out. That's a way from prison to Ephraim. Number two, look up. Whereas look out means be a blessing, look up means depend on God. So we're talking about dependence on God, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Psalm 127 from verse 1, except the Lord, unless the Lord builds the house, the laboring of one that builds it, except unless the Lord builds the city, the watchman will care but in vain. Look up. Look up, depend on God. We have always needed to depend on God, but much more at this time, anybody who will survive, who will be afloat, who will prosper in these difficult times, must learn to depend on God. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, because we are talking about Joseph, they said to him, we each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. And then they told him their dreams. He was saying, I have confidence in God. I know the interpretations belong to God. I know God has an answer for you. As a matter of fact, I know God has the answer. I don't know the questions of your heart now. I don't know the questions of your life. Not only does God have an answer, he has the answer to whatever specific issue you are dealing with. In Genesis 41, when he ended up standing before Pharaoh, again, Joseph said, Genesis 41 from verse 15, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have heard, excuse me, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can inter understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So look up. You have looked enough at those situations and circumstances, you have looked enough at the problems of Nigeria. Now, look up. Depend on God. 
If you could solve it, you would have solved it by now. If the government could handle it, they would have handled it by now. But as somebody who can never fail, his name is Jesus. Daniel was somebody else who looked up. In Daniel 1.17, the Bible tells us about him and his friends. And for these four young men, that is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel, so Daniel in particular now had understanding in all visions and dreams. All, not some, all visions and dreams. So the king had a dream and uh, he forgot the dream. He slept by himself, forgot the dream by himself. He now wanted to kill people who could not tell him the dream. And what he told them was a difficult thing. As a matter of fact, in fact, chapter 2, verse 11, hear what they say. It's a difficult thing that the king requests. And there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. You know, they were saying, what you're asking for is not possible. I mean, tell us the dream, we tell you interpretation. That's what everybody does. Well, the king didn't remember. And he was saying, hi, we know you can interpret it if you can tell me the dream. What kind of thing is that? You've been on my payroll, you have been enjoying food, and all of that, now it's time to perform. And he was going to kill everybody. And the kings were very powerful at that time. And they would have killed everybody, really. So Daniel said, in verses 16 to 19, so Daniel went in, asked the king to give him time. That he might tell, see, I find human nature interesting. Here was a king that said he was going to kill everybody. When those guys were saying what they were saying, he said, I know you will buy time. Somebody now came and said, give me time. And he gave the person time. Do you see human nature? The king truly wanted to know. He wanted to understand. So even if Daniel didn't know, just by suggesting he had an answer, the king was ready to give time. I mean, he just said now that, I know you guys will buy time. Go and kill everybody. And then somebody came and said, I have an answer. Even if it was going to be a lie, he was interested. Because he truly wanted the interpretation of the dream. And he knew the dream was significant. How many times do we have dreams and we forget? And we know there was something important to but he can't remember. So Daniel went to his house, verse 17, and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. Let me spare you because you can read all this later. Because eventually God revealed it to him. I'm saying, the Bible already told us, as we read in chapter 1 verse 17 that Danny had understanding in all visions and dreams but he knew he had to look up to God he knew he had to depend on God he knew he didn't carry it around I know you went to school I know you are very smart in mathematics I know so so and so, so that you better know that it's all about God eventually when he stood before the king the king said can you tell me the dream he said your Chaldeans your 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 uh, sorcerers your magicians your whatever could not understand his head, but there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven. So he ended up saying it. In Luke chapter 9 from verse 16, let's read about Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior, and the model or pattern son of God. Luke 9, 16. Then he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, look up, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. He looked up because he knew it was going to come from above. He knew God was the one that was going to do it in other words. Psalm 1, 2, 1, verses 1 to 2. I will look up to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. If God made the heavens and the earth and is our helper, Whatever you are looking for today, whatever you trust God for today, you see that in heaven or on earth. What he was saying is, the person who can handle everything is the source and going to be the source of it all. He was talking about the temple. He was talking about Mount Moriah. He was talking about the ark. He was talking about the symbol of God's presence. The most important and sacred piece of furniture in Israel was the ark because the presence of God manifested on that ark. So when he said, I will look up my history, that's what he was talking about. But today we are saying, look up, depend on God. We are not talking about God being far away in heaven. Because when we are thinking Old Testamently, we are thinking looking up is God from far away is going to answer. And that's going to take a long time. Acts 17 from verse 27, New Testament, Acts 17 from verse 27. Paul was speaking at Areopagos, and he said, so that they should seek the Lord, and the hope that they might grope for him and find him, 
though he's not far. Say with me, God is not far from me. He said, though he's not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. In John 14, 16 to 17, hear what Jesus said. So we're saying simply today, for us New Testament believers, the God you look up to in heaven lives in us by his spirit. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. First John 4, 4, you have got little children and over on them, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Say with me, God is in me. Say it again, God is in me. First Corinthians 3, 16, don't you know that you are the temple of God and God's spirit lives in you? So look up, depend on God, but don't think God is far away and out of reach. That God lives in you by his spirit. So help is not going to come from far away. Help is going to come from deep within you. So number one, look out. Be a blessing to others. Number two, look up. Depend on God. Number three, look straight. Joseph was forthright. He was forthright. There was no ambiguity. He wasn't evasive. He wasn't his son. He was frank. The two people who told him his dreams, the first one was positive. And when he finished saying the one that was positive, the other person, the Bible tells us, hearing that one was positive, said his own also. And he just told him straight. Genesis 40 from verse 16. Look straight. That's what we're seeing now. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, that is of the chief butler, because he had told him in three days' time, you'll be restored to your position. So ah, let me say my own too then. He said to Joseph, I also was in my dream. And there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of big goods of Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Wow. Just like that. I don't know if I would have said that if I were in Joseph's shoes. I don't know if I would have said that. That guy just tells someone in three days' time you are dead. That's tough. But that's what Joseph did. He didn't mince words. He didn't uh, talk like a politician. He was forthright. In Ephesians 4.15, the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. So I want to assume he may have said it in love somehow. But you know, in Proverbs 11.3, the Bible says the integrity of the upright will guide them. So all we need to ask sometimes is what will integrity do? If we can answer what integrity will do, that's what God is saying in the situation. Because he just told somebody what was positive now. And the second person was asking, it was negative. So what are you, I want to tell you. So he just told him to. Hmm. In Daniel's story, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. You can read it later. He saw a huge tree. Birds of the air came under the tree. There were plants, every, I mean, there were branches everywhere. Everything was flourishing and all that. And nobody could interpret it. And then he called for Daniel. And the Bible says Daniel was silent for a while. And the king encouraged him, speak, speak, don't be afraid to say it. Maybe we should read part of it. Daniel 4 from verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or his interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and his interpretation concern your enemies. And this is probably how I would have spoken if I was in Joseph's shoes. Verse 20, the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, and so on and so forth. He said, you are the one. What he was telling basically is, God has judged you, you are going to be dead. You are going to go and become like an animal in the forest. Your hair is going to be like, like your nails are going to be like, you know. Uh, and the Bible says 12 months after. So it even took some time before it came to pass. So if you think it's just easy to just tell somebody something like that straight. Daniel first said, hmm. He first said, okay, go ahead, say it, say it, say it. And say, may it happen to your enemies. God forbid. You do your hand like this, king, pay, you know. <laughs> 1 Samuel 16 from verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your home with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, you will kill me. 
But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and so on and so forth. So if you think these people are not normal human beings like you and I, now you see it. Because Saul was still alive. Saul was on the throne. Now God now told Samuel to go and anoint somebody else. He said, ah, but if Saul has you kill me. So you can give a word at the risk of your life. Nathan went to David and said, you know, somebody had many sheep. And then somebody had only one sheep that was like a daughter to him. And then a guest came and he took the only one. Ah, David was angry. Whoever did that should have said, you are the one. He now said, thus say the Lord. So I don't know whether that parable was from God or whether it was from Nathan. I don't know. Because where the Bible says, thus say the Lord was after he said, you are the one. Maybe I'd say, how do you go to tell a king that you are going to, ah, hey, hey. So maybe God gave him the idea. Maybe he thought of it himself. But you don't just go to somebody like that and just say, someone, they, <laughs> let's look at Elisha. 2 Kings 8 from verse 7. Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad king of Syria was sick. And it was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazel, take a present in your hand, go to meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, shall I recover from this disease? So Hazel went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads, and he came and stood before him and said, your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, shall I recover from this disease? Elisha said to him, go say to him, you shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will die. Hey, maybe now you understand what I'm saying. You think it's easy? <laughs> but for Joseph, son, just straight. He just said it straight. In Luke 19, from verse 8, Zaku, sorry, Zaku, Jenny, Kukuru, Osi, Kerem, but there's no Z in Yoruba. So, Zaku, Yoruba, Zaku. Sakyu jeni kukuru osi kere kuko ogun gisi kamore lo toro fe roluwa boluwa si tin koja lo ogbe osoke osi wi pe sakyu so kale wa whether it's a song or a speech you don't know how many people went to primary school okay how many people went to primary school you didn't go to primary school you started from secondary school Luke 19 from verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus was a sincere person. He didn't pretend that he didn't cheat anybody. He said, I've encountered you now. I donate half of my goods. So the ones that are legitimate, I give to the poor. The other ones that I cheated people of, if anybody comes here, I said, them. For fool, I will return to them. So look straight. Be a person of integrity. Be straightforward. Don't play politics with God. Don't try to butter it up or anything. Be straightforward. No, we are not saying we should not with wisdom. There are times you should talk. There are times you should not talk and all of that. But we're just seeing that Joseph looked out. He looked up. He looked straight. And God is saying, be a blessing. Depend on me. Be forthright if you want to go from prison to Ephraim. Number four, look where. Look where. Colossians 4.2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it. Have you noticed that? You've been vigilant. You remember just said watch and pray. We emphasize pray usually in church, but watch is there as well. We're supposed to recognize things that God brings our way. Part of what God will do at this time is to bring opportunities our ways. Opportunities don't always look like opportunities. Sometimes they are dressed in rags. Sometimes opportunities are going to come as problems. Pastor Moe was speaking to us about opportunities recently. Genesis 40 from verse 13. Now, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also, I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. If you think Joseph enjoyed prison, you are mistaken. Nobody enjoys prison. 
He saw an opportunity. He saw this was his way out. And the man forgot. Some people are terrible in life. Some people are ungrateful people in life. Some people, I mean, how can you interpret somebody's dream and say in three days you'll be restored? Now, if it, that's all that happened, we may excuse him. But he told the other person in three days you'll be dead. And three days after, you were restored and the person was killed and you forgot. Don't you never say and you forgot. Uh -uh. So what would have happened if Joseph did not say, when you get back to the prison, remember me. If he forgot this one, he would, he would not have forgotten for remember Joseph forever. It's heaven you he would have remembered him. The man said, remember me. He see, forgot for two whole years. And when Pharaoh had another dream and nobody could interpret it, do you realize Joseph would have been bitter at this time? Joseph may have thought God had forgotten him. Joseph may have thought there was no use serving God anymore. No use going to church anymore. No use joining activity team anymore. Everything is against me. Even God is against me. He showed me greatness and all of that. See where I am in life. I can never be what God said. And how can, can I continue to be straightforward? Somebody I even helped. And the person is back in prison. And they are telling me all the time that he's still with Pharaoh. And I've been here for two years. Which God? Where is the God? But eventually the man remembered him. We're going to talk about that in a while. But look where that we're saying is recognized opportunities. He saw that was an opportunity. He took it. Eventually, that's what worked for him. We all know the story of Jacob and Esau very well. Esau went out looking for food. There are people who leave home and look outside for what is at home. They are Christians. Instead of marrying a born again Christian, they want to marry a man who is tall, him and handsome because he's working in share. They've forgotten the Bible says, don't be equally yoked together with an unbeliever. When the problems, problems of life come, they forget. Don't look outside for what is at home. Because when their mother prepared the one at home, Isaac could not tell the difference. But here was Esau looking all over the place for that and rabbit. And then he came home and Jacob who was home was cooking. And he said, give me from that red pottage. And the guy said, can you give me your birthright? Ah, what did birthright have to do with food? He saw an opportunity. What I find instructive is that he says, swear. You are a fule fule person. So now you forget. Let's bring God in the matter. Swear. And he swore. And the Bible says, he despised his birthright. But we are seeing that Jacob saw an opportunity. No, I'm not saying we should take people's blessings from them. I'm only saying recognize opportunities. And this was not a once thing in his life. He met his uncle when he ran away from Esau. He met Uncle Laban. He didn't know Elewan Loga. <laughs> he did not know why you was in his family line. He thought he was a why you person. He now found out that the why you had been there from previous generations. He was working and his uncle called him and said, because you are my nephew does not mean you should work without pay. What would you like to be paid? He said, I want to marry Rachel. What did Rachel have to do with wages? He saw an opportunity. The man said, okay, okay. And then he gave him a wrong wife at first. What a family. So you see, we can see in the Bible that they are traits in families too. Yeah. The Bible doesn't hide those things from us. But you see, what we are seeing now is he was a man who recognized opportunities. For us today, may we recognize divine opportunities. In Psalm 119 verse 18, the Bible reads, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. We can apply this to other things and say, if we pray to God, open my eyes that I may recognize divine opportunities. So when God brings things our way, may we recognize that this is God at work. May our eyes not be close to things that God can use to bless us in life. Please say amen if you believe it. There were two thieves by the side of Jesus on the cross. Jesus was in pain. They were in pain as well. They were dying. And one of them was so hardened that he was mocking Jesus. That Shebi, they say you are savior. Why don't you Kuku, save yourself and us in this matter now? And the other person said, don't you even fear God? Are we not in the same situation? We deserve it. This man didn't deserve it. He said, Lord, please remember me when you got to your kingdom. Get to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, you will meet paradise. Both of them had the same opportunity. One went straight to hell. The other one went to heaven. He recognized an opportunity. 
Do you see what God is saying to us today? They both saw the same thing. And one was mocking. He thought he was a guy. Blowing guy with God. At the spring service today, I woke up to walk over to my mother. The only place she he pocketed. And I was just looking at her and I said, do you know this God we are worshiping? You are pocketing. I was just looking around. I don't pocket it. Blowing, blowing guy. <laughs> the only blowing guy for God. <laughs> so he smiled. He told the other person in my side what I said. And then he started saying, yeah, because that you don't know the son does not mean you should can't be looking at like anything. You are looking at the type of thing. The guy before God. But the true collection, praise God. So I didn't say it at that service. Uh, it's this service I'm saying it now. The people who say they use me to preach, you know, that's another quality you pay now. So I didn't say it at the spring service. In Luke 19, from verse 41, Jesus wept as he entered Jerusalem. He said they were going to be bound. This will happen, that will happen. Why? Because they did not know the time of their visitation. That's why. So when you don't recognize divine opportunities, things will be tough and rough and dark. And when you recognize divine opportunities, it's part of how God lifts us up in life. So look well. Watch and pray. Don't just pray. Watch as well. It will look like service sometimes. Come and do this. It will look like it will look like it has no bearing with it sometimes. But if you will do it and recognize that this is God's hand, such a thing happened to me recently. I recognized an opportunity. I, I knew this was something significant, and what God brought out of it made me to give Him glory and praise and honor. May we recognize divine opportunity. So look where. Finally, look through. Look through. In Genesis 40, we've talked about it. Maybe I should just read one or two verses from verse 21. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, that is Pharaoh did. He placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, just like the, the Joseph said will happen. Verse 22, he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Verse chapter 21 from, chapter, excuse me, 41 from verse 1. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and so on and so forth. Then nobody could interpret the dream. And they must say, Yay, I remember my fall today. Two years ago, so, 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 so quickly they went to bring him. Supposing Joseph quit. Supposing Joseph stopped serving God. Supposing Joseph committed suicide. Supposing, whatever, supposing whatever you may think. But he was patient. He waited. It seemed like God was delaying. But at the time, it will matter the most. That's why God showed up for him. So God is never in a hurry but he never har arrives too late. Have you heard this before, that the time the king comes out is the time? If a king, traditional king, gives you an appointment for 2 o'clock, and you get there at 2, and he comes out at 6 o'clock, that's 2 o'clock. Because he's a king, that's why. So whatever time the king comes out, that's the time. God can never arrive too late. The Bible says God can never lie. So if you have not had a child, and God says, there shall not be barren in the land. God can never lie. So whatever time the king comes out, that's 2 o'clock. If he comes out at 6, that's 2 o'clock. If God says you are well, when you think you are sick, you are well if you believe it. Because he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Glory to God forever. Hebrews 6 from verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Until the end. That you do not become sluggish or lazy, the version says, but imitate those who through faith and patience, not all, faith and patience inherit the promises. If we are going to inherit the promises of God, not only are we going to have faith in God as we sang in him earlier today, but also we are going to be patient. Hebrews 10 from verse 35, King James says, Cast not therefore away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, making it says perseverance. So our confidence in God will be rewarded if we are patient. Our confidence in God will be rewarded. If you are confident in God, it's a matter of time. Just be patient, it will be rewarded. This guy waited two whole years past, but eventually he was remembered because God did not forget him. Psalm 105 from verse 17. If you are familiar with the Bible, you know Psalm 103, Psalm 104, Psalm 105. There are things that refer to the journeys of Israel and so much to learn there. So Psalm 105 from verse 17. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in the irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. 
to bind princes and so on and so forth. I mean, does a slave in a foreign land become a prime minister? No. But God has done it before. And that means he can do it again. So you are not a literal slave, I know. But maybe you are small, dark, empty, bound, uncomfortable, locked in. There seems to be no way out. But God wants to take you to a place where you will forget. And then you become fruitful and prosperous. The word of the Lord tested him. The Bible doesn't tell us how. The word of the Lord tested him. So for God's word to come to pass in his life, he had to pass through some tests. We can imagine by using today's message as part of the tests he passed. For instance, it's a test of selflessness because he looked out even though things were dark for him. So God told, tested him that this man is going to be a blessing. If I put him in a position, he will help people. If at this time in prison, he's looking out for other people. He passed the test in focus. Instead of thinking it was a big deal, he said, all interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dream. It's about God. His focus was on God. God will get the glory for whatever happened in his life. He passed the test of integrity. Instead of trying to play around with words, he told the man, in three days, I'm sorry to say, your head will be gone. So he passed the test of integrity. He passed the test of sensitivity. When that man was going back to the palace, he said to him, remember me where you get there. He was sensitive that this was an opportunity God gave to him. And he passed the test of patience as well. I'm just trying to talk about the things we have seen today. He was patient. He didn't try to take the law into his hands. He didn't try to make it happen by himself. Because we can do that. Let's read about David also, 1 Samuel 26. Because God said David was a man after his own heart. You don't read about David and not gain something. 1 Samuel 26 from verse 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night. And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp. With his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please, let me strike him at once. Really, just once. With despair. Right to the earth. And I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. Or his day shall come to die. Or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please, take now his spear and so on and so forth. Take evidence. I'm impressed and amazed by the kind of person David was. Samuel had prophesied. Samuel had singled him out amongst his brothers. Samuel had poured all upon him. Samuel was a Kibati prophet. And Saul had lost all honor and respect in the natural. His friend, Jonathan, what? It was a big deal about Saul. And Saul was just there. I believe David was passing tests with these kinds of things. Who will see his enemy and allow him to go like that? Somebody will take the army of a nation to run after you. And the man said, let me just, once God has delivered him, he spiritualized because he knew David was a spiritual man. God has delivered your enemy to your hand. Let me just strike him once and that's the end of it. And David said, who can talk the Lord's hand and give him When you see this, don't ever join people to destroy anybody. You don't need to put out somebody else's light to light your own candle in life. He said God may judge him or his day will come that he will die. Meaning there's a time somebody should live out to their night normally but there are different ways to die. There are different reasons to die. God can smite him. He can go to war and not come back. Or his day can come to die but I am not going to take love. But it was prophesied. Maybe this is the way. No. I'm not going to take it into my hands. I will wait for God. I will wait for God. I will wait for God. We are talking about looking through, being patient, knowing that if God promised you something, God is able to make it to come to pass. So you can go from prison to praise. You can go from lack to riches. You can go from high hell to honor in life. And if you're already fruitful today, keep looking because your path can still be more fruitful. The path of the just, like a shining light, that shining more and more. So continue to look out Continue to look up. Continue to look straight. Continue to look well. Continue to look through. Let's stand to our feet to pray. Thank God for his word today. If you got anything from his word today, give him praise and glory. Most importantly, remember that God is with you. If you are born again Christian, God is with you. And not just that he's with you, he's in you. So God for me, God with me, God in me. It's unbeatable. God for me, God with me, God in me. It's unbeatable. Thank God for his word. Whatever you are going through, however it's been like, whatever challenges you think you are facing, 
God with you makes all the difference. So the Bible doesn't hide from us that he was in prison. The Bible doesn't hide from us he was a house help, alone, or somebody from an important family, well-to-do family, doing that kind of job in life. And yet God was with him. How can life be like this for somebody that God is with? Is it your marriage? Is it your career? Is it your health? Is it your children? Is it your finances? God is with you. Something occurred to me earlier on in this house. God said, Aaron and Co. should speak to people and say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes special and bless you. Remember that scripture? And he said, when they say so, I will visit them and I will bless them. Now, why doesn't God just do it? Since he wants to be able to, why, why doesn't he just do it? Why does he say they have to say it before I do it? It means if words are not spoken into one's life, those things may not happen. Do you remember the Bible says a city is, is blessed because of the righteous in the city? And the Bible says, ah. so we have to speak over. We have to speak over our lives. We have to say those things. So God can see me. God can know what I'm going through. God can do something if he wants to do it. No, he has showed us from his word that words have to be spoken for those things to happen. So will you open your mouth and speak words to your life today? Please speak words. Speak words to your life. God is with me. God is for me. God is in me. Now let's talk to God about the things we receive today. I'm going to be a blessing from today. Help me, Lord, to look out. Help me to look out. Help me to always look up, to depend on you. You can never fail. Look straight. Help me to be forthright. Help me to be a person of integrity. Help me to speak the truth in love. Help me to be sincere. Look well. Help me to be sensitive to divine opportunities. Help me to recognize because opportunities won't always look like opportunities. Sometimes they will look like a pay drop. Yeah, it will look like a pay drop. How can you leave this kind of job for this kind of job? But you know God wants you to be with your family. That's a word for somebody. God wants you to be with your family. And so you take that step and take a pay drop. And when the opportunities now show up later, you will thank God. Look through. Be patient. God did not promise that it's going to happen overnight. But if God said his word, you can go to bed. Because if you will do what his word says, it will come to pass. Father, we thank you this morning. We are very, very, very grateful. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for letting us know you have us in mind. Thank you for our situation and circumstances. We know in the natural what things are like in the country. But well, even what other places also there are challenges. And so where you want us to be is the best place to be. And Lord, you will move on our behalf. As a matter of how you have moved on our behalf. Your hand is stretched forth already. No one can turn it back. Thank you for it. Turn around in our situation circumstances. Let our lives be show pieces of what God can do. Use our lives to make a statement in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you like to tell God about your needs this morning? What you want him to do? What you want him to address? So that we start from there. If you need healing for your body, lay your hand on that part of your body and be healed. And be healed. Somebody has been in severe pain just below the sternum. What uh, comfort because solar plagues us, you know, there's a place here, just here. Severe pain that makes you double over. Be healed now in the name of Jesus Christ. Every hand laid on every part of the body, Father, we believe you to address. We believe you to touch everyone. We rebuke every ache, every pain, every infirmity. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be healed, be whole now. Receive it in Jesus' name. You may please be seated. I see a left knee. The knee appeared to have shifted a little when you were walking. Just like shifted a little. So you are very careful to put weight on it. Start to put weight on it now because God healed you. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you if today you are saying, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be born again. I want to be sincere. I know I'm not serving God for real according to the Bible. I want to begin to do so. Or maybe you even served him at a time. You stopped serving him, you want to come back to him today. So you want to be restored in your relationship with God. 
I would like to pray for you. Whichever one. Heads bowed, eyes shut, everyone pray in my name's business. Can you lift your hand and put it down? I'll know you want to be prayed for. If I see your hand, I'll know you want to be prayed for. Pray for me, Pastor. I want to give my life to you. Thank you. Please put your hand on your chest. Anybody else? Okay, I've seen a few people. Anybody else, please? Male, female, young, older, comfortable or uncomfortable. Now, if you put your hand on your chest, please stand up where you are with your hand still on your chest. You are just saying, here am I. Here am I. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Stand up with your hand on your chest. Just be sincere. is God, not man. I can't save you. Now, say after me, please, if you are standing. Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Jesus died for my sins. He rose again. I invite him into my life now to be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life completely, totally. Help me to live for you forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your children who responded to your word here physically or elsewhere. Establish them in the path of righteousness. Grant them grace to run this race successfully to the very end. And let them begin to see from today the blessings and benefits of serving the Lord through Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please follow the person by your side to the back. Take your back to the back for a few minutes. I, somebody was supposed to be by my brother's side also. Nobody's there. But please just follow them also to the back. Thank you. I think there was someone else or some other people at the back also. They had, please just follow them to the back. God bless you. So if somebody was by your side, follow the person. If nobody was by your side, please just join the people going to the back now. Just for a few minutes. Go with your bag or Bible. 